Uh, so I'm glad that you're here. We're continuing our journey. Uh, really, uh, these are the last few weeks of our Vision and Values series. I'll share a little bit about what's ahead, but before I do, let me share about where we've been. That if you've been here, perhaps you've missed a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Let me just remind you sort of the ground that we've covered. Um, I'll also make a plug as well. Uh, you can go to our website and uh, find a link to our YouTube page where all of our, all the messages in this series and going forward are recorded there. So if you ever miss a week, feel free uh, to catch up online um, so that you can be a part of the conversation going forward. But we, uh, as we've talked about in this vision series, we believe um, that God has placed a special calling on us as a church. Really, I think we believe that that's true for all churches, that in uh, God's kingdom work, God is moving in the world and inviting us to catch up, to come be a part of it, and that we don't want to take that for granted, and that uh, for us as a local church, just as God makes each of us unique, uh, fearfully and wonderfully made, I think that all churches are fearfully and wonderfully made as well. And so part of our task is to strive together to be faithful to the unique God, uh, the unique calling God has placed on us. So we exist, King's Cross Church, we exist to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness in and through Jesus Christ. And we do that because we believe that whole people can change the whole world. That as we become more whole, that as God transforms our brokenness into wholeness, that we have the capacity, God has the capacity to change the trajectory of whole lives, whole families, whole cities, and the whole world. And so that's why we do what we do. Now we believe that fundamentally, if we look throughout Scripture and really throughout much of the history of the world, that God prefers, God so often works His transformative, redemptive work through relationship. We believe that we are made for relationship, and this work of embracing brokenness and championing wholeness happens best in relationship. So, speaking of plugs, let me make a plug that if if you're ready to take your next step, if you're ready to move towards embracing your own brokenness, moving towards wholeness in your own life, being a part of that journey with other people, let me encourage you to do that in community. We have people at the Welcome Centers after the service that would love to talk to you about our Bible study groups, help you to find a community to be in relationship with to do this work. We believe it's important and we invite you to come be a part of it. The last section of our Vision Values series has been around core values. So we've talked about three core values before. These are the things that we believe we're going to strive to do best, to do with excellence, with uniqueness. And some of these core values go back to the early days of the church, the founding days of the church 23 years ago. Uh, so some of them are realized values, maybe values that we want to even recover or expand on. And some of these values uh, are new. These values are aspirational in a way. They're targets for us to move towards, to strive towards hitting and growing as a church. And so we've talked about the core values of a commitment to the next generation, a commitment to the pioneering spirit that we find in Christ. And last week we talked about the core value of simplicity. We talked about that it's not for us a value of poverty, but of simplicity, that God invites us um, from the day of Jesus' own ministry on earth, God invites us to simplify, not because uh, for the sake of simplicity, it's not a passive simplicity, but rather it's an active, purposeful simplicity that as we simplify our lives, God provides us the opportunity to orient our lives to the things that matter the most, first and foremost being Him. So as we simplify, if we do it well, we create the space for our lives to mirror our priorities and our values, and change begins to happen. So today we're uh, moving on to our fourth core value, four of five. We'll hit the fifth one next week, and then we'll wrap up our vision and value series at the end of November. I'll talk briefly about what that'll be like today, because uh, it's connected to really our core values of this week and next week. 
and then after the end of November, we'll be uh, to the 1st of December, and it will be Advent. We've got to get baby Jesus here. So we'll be working together as a church uh, to get baby Jesus here, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about what's coming in the new year. Um, I would say right now, and we'll talk more about this as a church, but <clears throat> you heard me mention giving earlier, that really it's a conversation. Um, there's an old word for this that's been used in the life of the church, but uh, we often talk about stewardship. This idea really of management, that all that we have, God has given to us. Not that we didn't work for it, not that we didn't have a part to play in the midst of it, but that really all that we have from our health to our dreams, our passions, our gifts, our talents, our finances, all of those things, God has has entrusted to us and how we manage them, how we steward them is important. So we'll have a conversation about holistic stewardship early on in the new year as well as probably uh, a few other things that I'll, I'll hold off on. I'll, I'll tease you with uh, just that, but we'll talk more about what we're going to be focusing on in the first quarter of next year here pretty soon. Uh, but today, our fourth core value, our fourth core value this morning as a church is the core value of multiplication core value of multiplication. If you have a copy of scripture uh, with you this morning, let me encourage you to turn or swipe over to Acts chapter 2, and uh, we'll read together. Um, as you're doing that, let me, uh, I got to come clean with you this morning. If you get a copy of our midweek update on Wednesdays, uh, let me say this. If you don't get a copy of our midweek update, go to our website. You can uh, find um, a way to request access to KC Online. It's kind of our church online portal. And once you're online, you can sign up for our midweek update. It's an email from me about what, to, what we covered the past Sunday, what's coming up the next Sunday, some important announcements, things like that. But in this week's midweek update, I talked about how our focus this morning would be on access Acts chapter 2 and Matthew 14. And Acts chapter 2 is absolutely our focus this morning, but um, as I really begin to think more and more about it, and even had conversations with some of you this week, I realized that there is a, a little bit of backstory, not in Matthew's gospel, um, which is really kind of a future uh, connectional piece to us that, that we'll talk about, but really there's some backstory in the book of Genesis that in order to make sense of Acts chapter 2, we need to be clear on a couple things that have happened uh, back in Genesis. So um, we're going to save Matthew. Uh, actually, we'll come back to that in two weeks. Um, you'll see this morning uh, the importance that the Lord's Supper plays uh, in the life of the early church. And so one of the things we're going to do here in two weeks as we end our Vision and Values series is to celebrate that and celebrate our shared future together by uh, taking communion. So we'll come back to Matthew 14. Consider that, that you've read ahead. Extra credit on your part. Well done. Um, but I'll, I'll share more with you about that. And so this morning we'll be in Acts chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 11. As we get ready to read here Acts chapter 2, we'll be in verse 41, the end of uh, Acts chapter 2, really the formation, though, the beginning of the early church. Um, but before I do that, let me give you just a real brief context about the, both the book of Acts and where we are in chapter 2. So the thing to know about Acts is it's best for us to really consider it, to think about it as the second half of one large book, um, that we, it would not be wrong for us to talk about uh, not the book of Acts, but the book of Luke-Acts. That the same author who wrote Luke wrote uh, the book of Acts and wrote it to the same person. If you were to go back, you would see it's written to Theophilus, which makes it sound like this is a, a guy named Theophilus, um, which last time I checked hasn't cracked the top 100 baby names in a, probably a couple millennia. But um, uh, Theophilus, oddly enough, could, could very well be absolutely a uh, very real person, but it also could be a stand-in for a broader idea Theophilus. Theophilus literally means, it's, it's a name that's made up of two small words, Theo and Philus. It, it means uh, God lover. That the book of Luke Acts is written to the one who loves God, Theophilus. And so what this suggests to us is that the content of Luke, which is really the introduction of the gospel story, um, this sort of uh, birth of hope, of redemption into the world, and then the book of Acts, which is the story of the birth of the church. It's meant to be this unified whole, but it's written to Theophilus, to God lover, that it's really meant, it's written for believers. Believers. It's meant for those who know something of the story. And yet, 
It's a story of beginnings. This is important for us. It's instructive for us because uh, too often we forget that a large part of who we are and who we become is due in no small part to the stories that are told to us. Particularly the stories told to us about us. That if you think about it, so often who we are from a very young age, we are hungry for someone to tell us a story about us. And the stories we hear about ourselves radically impact our future. Did you grow up hearing that you are a blessing or a burden? Did you grow up hearing that you were loved or despised? That you are unique or that you are nothing special? The stories we hear from a very young age have a radical impact on us. And so there's a lot of wisdom in Luke's work uh, of Luke Acts in trying to tell the early Christians, the God lovers, this is who you are, who you were made to be, who you were valued to be, who you were hoped and dreamed and to be in. And so we come to Acts here in the book, the story of the formation of the early church. And we'll read here our focus this morning at the end of chapter 2. But earlier uh, in chapter 2, the earlier verses there, it's the arrival of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descends, the tongues of fire come, and people begin talking in all kinds of different languages. And this is important, uh, we'll come back to this here in a moment, but as people begin talking in various languages, it's important for us to remember that they're talking each in the language of their own people. That what they don't hear is one common tongue. They're not speaking one singular language, but the gospel is being preached each in their own language. And that that is the first miracle of the Holy Spirit's coming. Hold on to that idea. So Pentecost comes, they begin speaking, the communication is made possible, Peter begins to preach and people begin to come to faith. And then, as people become to faith, it says in verse 41 uh, that those who believed what Peter said were baptized, they were added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Not a bad day's work for Peter, right? And that's where we come in in verse 42. As you're reading, let me encourage you, one, to think about, well, what does this have to do with multiplication? But also, more importantly, what does this have to do with the early church, what it means to be the church. Let me read for us, uh, beginning in verse 42, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. It says, All the believers then devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper. And to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. We'll come back to this here in a minute, but I want us to um, connect a few dots and take a step back to where we are. This is a moment where it's important for us here at the beginning or what really is perhaps a new beginning for God's people and God's work in the world, to connect what's happening here with the broader, larger story of salvation history, of God's redemptive work in the world. So uh, stick a finger there. We'll come back to it here in a moment. But I wanted us this morning, I, to me, really the story of Pentecost and the birth of the early church really is not intelligible to me without going back and understanding a little bit from Genesis. So turn with me very briefly to uh, Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to read just a few verses for us. We're going to look at the story of Babel. 
What's significant here, just to refresh you briefly on Genesis, Genesis is uh, literally a story of beginnings. There's a reason it's first in the Bible, and it starts at the beginning of the beginning, all the way back, right? But what's happening here, though, what's important is that of Genesis 50 chapters, we can look at where the focus is. Where does the author spend their energy? Gives us some insight into what the hope or the purpose of Genesis is. So of 50 chapters, we can look and see that beginning in chapter 12 all the way through chapter 50, Genesis focuses on a single family. Really about four or five generations of that family, right? It's the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their children. That really much of Genesis' focus is this family. And that while Genesis is concerned ultimately with beginnings, really where it puts its emphasis and energy is not simply on broad creation, but really the creation of God's people. That Genesis, at its heart, is concerned with telling the story of the beginning of God's people. And that story of Abraham begins in chapter 12. Abram, where he starts, and, and honestly, truthfully, begins about halfway through chapter 11 uh, with the genealogy of Abram. And so the story we're reading this morning, the Tower of Babel, is the last story the last moment of Genesis before Abram enters the scene, before the story changes, before the shift takes place, and really the beginning of Abraham, that is the beginning of the Old Testament story, that what happens with Abraham really sets off the rest of Scripture. And so it's worth us paying attention what's happening leading up to Abraham's arrival, his advent, his arrival on the scene. And so let me read for us here Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through uh, 9. And this is what it says. It says, At one time all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. They said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united. They speak all the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that same way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. And from there, this is the account of Shem's family, the line of descent from Shem to Abram. What an interesting story, right? The Tower of Babel. Now, it'd be really easy for us. We have to be careful. There's a, there's a few easy mistakes to make here. It's very easy for us, particularly when we just drop in, we kind of parachute in to the book of Genesis to read this and say, well, man, God seems a little cranky here, right? <laughs> seems like he's having an off day. What's the big deal, right? Language is good. Communication is good. Building is good. What's going on here? And so it's important for us to recognize that uh, there's, a few, there's a few things about what God is concerned about, what God is upset about. I don't think that God is fundamentally upset that, that people can talk to each other, right? I don't think God is fundamentally upset that they decided to build something together. But rather, the deep concern for God is what they're using their language for and the reasoning and the rationale behind what they're building, you see, it's important for us to remember that God has given the people of the world a mandate. 
the same mandate, not once, but twice. First, in Genesis 1, 28, he says to Adam and Eve, Now go, be fruitful, and multiply. Well, that kind of worked out, sort of not really. And things get, uh, they go from amazing, wonderful paradise to not so great. Sin enters the world, really. It's the breaking of the world. Brokenness enters into the story, and it's been nothing but sort of a downward drop since then, to the point that when we get to Noah, just a few chapters before here in Genesis 11, things are so bad, God says, let's start over. Let's shake the Etch-A-Sketch up. Let's select all, delete, whatever metaphor you want to use. He says, let's start over. Takes Noah, saves him and his family. The rest of the world is rebooted in a fashion. And as Noah and his family, the animals come out of the ark, what does God say to them in Genesis 9, 7? He says, now go, be fruitful, and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And here we are, sort of the culmination, really, of the brokenness of the world up to this point. And what is happening? This power that the people have, this power for communication, for collaboration, for construction together, on the one hand, it underscores the power of all of those things. Look at what they can do. God says, there is nothing that they cannot do, right? And yet, it is deeply concerning to God. Because you see, the Genesis vision is what? Is that the people of God are not meant to be a monolithic, uniform, singular people. But that God has created a diversity of people and that God's vision for the world is that the people of God do what? That they go out as regents as leaders, as caretakers of creation, and that they be fruitful and multiply. You see, the Tower of Babel is a fundamental rejection and resistance of the call of God by the people of God. Because what are the people, the, the Tower of Babel, what are they attempting to do? They're not attempting to go out. Their fear is what, Scripture tells us, they're resistant to being scattered. They're resistant to being sent out. They're resistant to being fruitful and multiplying. And so what do they decide to do? They decide to say, well, what if we circle the wagons? What if we build a fortress? What if we stay where we are and instead of building out, they build up? Instead of multiplying, they move towards a monolithic singularity divorced from God. And God looks out and says, this is not good. So what's fascinating to me about this, where we connect the dots this morning, is that the final stroke the final straw in the story of Genesis, before God initiates his covenant plan, before God connects with Abraham, which is really the beginning of Jesus' story, right? For we trace Jesus' arrival all the way back to Abraham, that before God decides that Jesus is what must come, what must save the world, really the crescendo of brokenness in the world, is a resistance and a rejection to God's call to be fruitful and multiply. That it is the Tower of Babel that begins the covenant story. Now hold that in your mind and we can flip back to Acts chapter 2. Pentecost, right? Look back there. You can skim over the first uh, 13 verses of Acts 2 if you want. But what happens now that Jesus has come, right? The full culmination of the covenant has arrived. Jesus has lived, died, and now lives again. He's ascended into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit as he promised he would. And what is the first act of the Holy Spirit on earth? It is the restoration of communication. That is the Tower of Babel where God comes in and says, it is better for me to scatter you, to scramble your language, than to allow your unredeemed 
collaboration. That you can do anything, but without redemption, without salvation, it will not be good. It will not be good. And so it is better for the world, it is better for you, it is safer for you, for me to scatter you until the work of wholeness can reach fruition. But so then what comes the moment the Spirit comes into the world? Communication is restored, but how is it restored? We've got to pay attention here, right? It is not the restoration of one singular language. It's not the restoration of one singular culture. It is not uniformity. It's unity. And that is a radical, important difference. That the advent of the Spirit, the restoration of the world as it should be, the movement to redeem creation, the new creation is come. It is a creation that celebrates diversity. It is a creation that celebrates collaboration, construction, building, redemption, but it is one that at its core, at the life of the Spirit, is not a singular tower where everyone must come in and think as we think, talk as we talk, believe as we believe, but rather than building up what happens, the early church begins to build out. The early church begins to do what? To fulfill the mandate of Adam and Eve. To fulfill the mandate of Noah. The early church begins to be fruitful and to multiply. This is for us a fundamental life and death struggle. Because if the Tower of Babel tells us anything, it tells us that our natural inclination in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our unredeemed world, right? Our normal default position is to what? To build up. To say, I'm going to build my walls, and you can either be inside or you can be outside. You can either be like me or not. You can be good or bad, black or white, in or out. That in the midst of our brokenness, we choose to use our power for communication, our power to build, our power really that God invests us how as stewards of the world, we become kings in our own eyes. Right? We talked about before how in Genesis 1, the fundamental sin of Adam and Eve, they go and they eat the apple. Why? Because the serpent tells them, well, if you do that, you will see like God. That at the core of our sin is the fundamental desire to be the God of our life. And the Tower of Babel is in many ways the manifestation of that on a grand scale. Let's not build out into God's creation. Let's build up to be like God, right? And so the early church is for us, the coming of the Spirit is for us, this radical redemption of God's calling on us as the people of God to be fruitful and to multiply. And so we choose as a church to value, to sacrifice for, to make hard decisions for multiplication that we believe it is a mandate for us as a church to be fruitful and to multiply. Well, let's talk about for a minute what that means. Because if you're like me, the only time you ever heard being fruitful and multiplying is when preachers would get up there and make some awkward comment on having babies, right? That's about the only time you ever hear someone, well, I'm looking at you, you young parents out there. The nursery's looking a little empty. Let's be fruitful and multiply, all right? Let's go team, right? This is how we, usually, how we usually think about and talk about being fruitful and multiplying. You know it's true. I know you're laughing. You're laughing because you've heard it before, right? Well, for us, we, that's part of it, sure, right? May your quiver be full, right? I got a lot of these preacher <laughs> euphemisms for this stuff, right? We can, we can go on for a while here, but I'll spare you. Some of you are getting a little uncomfortable, I know. But, all right, let me, sex is good. God made sex. Sex is for marriage. Sex is good. All right, let's move on. It's true. 
So what does it mean for us to be fruitful and multiply? I don't know. Can we come back from this? I don't know. Let's see if we can, see if we can pull this back in. So, um, so what does it mean for us as a church to value, to sacrifice for, to strive for multiplication? Let's talk about that. So for us, you'll see on the screen that we value multiplication demonstrated by at least four different things. Well, I'll tell you what, actually, let me back up. Um, I've got one more, one more thing to show you. Sorry, I skipped ahead, Tim. Um, there's, there's two things uh, that I wanted to draw our attention to before we get to, to uh, living out these core values. There's at least two things. I don't know as you read uh, this in preparation for this morning or for uh, as we read it here uh, today, um, what stood out to you in that, that 42 through uh, 47 of Acts chapter 2? It's really the first glimpse of the early church. At its, at its infancy. Um, what do we see here? There's, there's two things that really stood out to me and that we'll talk about this morning. The first is how prominent the Lord's Supper is. Did you catch that? It's mentioned at least twice in five, six verses that they met daily, they grounded their life in the Lord's Supper. And we'll come back and, and talk about this here in two weeks as we wrap up our series. Um, but we have to remember that fundamentally the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the Last Supper, which is in many ways a remembrance of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, particularly his death and his resurrection. But that Jesus himself, that just as Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and shares it, just as Jesus takes the cup, blesses it, passes it, shares it, that Jesus is himself blessed, broken, and given for us. And so for me, not only is the importance of the Lord's Supper underscored here, but I was struck particularly in verse 46 that they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and generosity. That there was something about the early church, there was something about being fruitful and multiplying. There was something about this restoration of communication. Again, that everyone heard the gospel, everyone experienced the gospel in their own tongue in a way that made sense to them. That what changed wasn't them. They didn't have to change who they were in order to hear the gospel, but the way the gospel was told changed so that they could hear. This is important, right? This is going out, not up. But that when the early church came and did this, they did these radical things of selling all that they had, living together, they were in church together every day. And they still got along. Seemingly. Allegedly, right? <laughs> they were together every day, worshiping in the temple, meeting in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared all that they had. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And to me, I have a strong belief that that joy is only possible because of their connection to the supper. That without remembering Christ's joyful self-sacrifice, their self-sacrifice would not have been possible. So I've been thinking about joy, and I came across this. You'll see there's a, a quote from uh, C.S. Lewis up there. And, and sit with it here for a minute. I'll read it for us. And I've I really wrestled with this one because I think he's right, but I don't know exactly why he's right. Um, but he says this in his book, Surprised by Joy, which I would commend to you, by the way. Most of what C.S. Lewis writes is fiction. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia, his space trilogy, both are great. Uh, and then he writes some uh, kind of nonfiction, mere Christianity, abolition of man. But Surprised by Joy is one of the few biographical works that he writes about himself. And it's about his conversion from atheism uh, to theism to Christianity. And this is what he says. He calls the book Surprised by Joy. He says this. He says, All joy reminds it is never a possession. Hmm. It is never a possession. Always a desire for something longer ago or further away or still about to be. Joy, it is never a possession. 
but it is always a desire for something longer ago, further away, or still about to be. I, I've wrestled with this, and I think, I think he's right, because what he's talking about is that joy has to be grounded in a realization of something that was done for us in the past, something that will be done for us in the future, something that is yet to come or that has already come, and that in it we find gratitude, and that gratitude translates to joy. And so for me, as we think about the early church, that they came together, shared everything together, and it wasn't begrudgingly, it wasn't full of guilt, it wasn't reluctantly, but that the early church came together. They were fruitful and they multiplied and they did it joyously and generously. It's that community that goes on and changes the world. You and I are here today, 2,000 years later, because these early believers were blessed, broken, and given. That these believers gave what they had, shared the gospel joyously and generously. They were fruitful and they multiplied. And I believe for them it was grounded in the recognition of what the supper reminded them. That we give because Christ gave to us. We love because Christ loves us. We hope because Christ is hope in us. Joy is not something we have, but it is a reminder of what has been done or what is yet to come. So how do we as a church embody this today, 2,000 years later? Um, We've got a few lawyers in the church. It'd be glad for you to deed your homes to us after the service. It'd be great if you have any property, a boat, that would be fine too. No. We're not going to ask you to sell everything to come live in the church. Um, we have a little bit different view, particularly this longer view, right? We've got to remember parts of the early church, right? Their assumption was that Jesus was coming right back, right? That um, even at the ascension, right, the disciples are there, Jesus ascends into heaven, and they just keep standing there. An angel has to come and says, hey guys, like he's going to be a little while. Get to work. He gave you some things to do. Uh, and so they, they continues to kind of evolve, right, this understanding that uh, we don't know when Jesus will come back, right? So we live into our calling, into the faithfulness that God has given us calling to faithfulness God has given us. So how do we today, how do we translate 2,000 years later in 2019, 2020 in Tullahoma, Tennessee, what does it look like for us to be fruitful and to multiply? Well, we choose going forward as a church to value multiplication as demonstrated by at least these four things. First, we value multiplication as demonstrated by a culture of joyful generosity that we strive together to not give begrudgingly, to not give reluctantly, but to give joyfully by remembering what was done for us and what is yet to be done for us, right? It's demonstrated by a culture of joyful generosity. Next, by striving, uh, striving for, towards rather unity, not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity, that I believe as we read scripture here that God's real desire for us is a celebration of our differences, yet a set of differences that are grounded, unified together in the call of Christ. That if we go back even to, to one of my favorite passages in Isaiah where God talks about the feast at the end of days, the feast that God will host on the mountain of God on Mount Zion, what does he say? All the nations will be gathered. Not, I will forge you all into one nation. I will forge you all to look like the victors, to look like this person or that person, to talk this way or to do that. He says, no, everybody's coming in the midst of their diversity. All the nations are coming. We value multiplication demonstrated by a commitment to learning our story and sharing it. 
that perhaps one of the most powerful things we have to offer to God, to be blessed, broken, and shared, is our story, and that we're going to strive together to be people that learn our story, our personal story, the story of our lives, the story of our faith, and even the story of our church that we strive together to multiply who we are by sharing our story. And finally, we value multiplication as demonstrated by a willingness to sacrifice our preferences for people. That we recognize our joy and generosity leads us to this calling to be fruitful and multiply, to build out into creation, to the ends of the earth, the Gospels would say, rather than to just build up, to build a fortress, to build some walls, and say, y'all come if you want. Here's the one door. Hope you pass the test. Hope you dress the right way. Hope you talk the right way. Hope you live in the right neighborhood and act the right way. No. Blessed are the feet of those who carry the gospel. We're meant to carry it, y'all. We're meant to be blessed, broken, and shared. To be fruitful and to multiply, to go and to bring it to the world. That's our calling. That's how we'll be successful. That's how embracing brokenness and championing wholeness comes to live and change the world. And so it's going to be tough, sacrificing our preferences for people, being vulnerable to learn our story, celebrating unity and not expecting uniformity, being a culture of joyful generosity. We'll have to work at it, but we can do it. And I think when we do it, as we do it, we'll begin to change and the world will begin to change around us. So here's my challenge for you as our worship team comes back up this morning. As you begin to think about, well, what does multiplication look like? I get perhaps at a certain level what that looks like for us as a body of believers, as a church. How do we do this? Well, how, how do we start? How, do, how can you and I do that this week? My invitation to you, my challenge for you, is for you to look for an opportunity once per day for the next seven days to multiply yourself. Here is, I don't want you to miss this, here at the heart of this message, right? Celebration of diversity. Recognition of the trust, the empowerment that God gives all of us. This isn't a job, this isn't a task for somebody else to do. This isn't just for the pastor to go out and do it. It's not just for the really good Christians. Not just for the professionals, the long timers. It's not for someone who's further along than me. It's not for someone who's better at this than me. It is for all of us. To be fruitful and to multiply. And perhaps for you, that's your faith story. That's your journey. That's the hope that you have, right? First Peter says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Maybe that's what you share once a day this week. But for you, perhaps it's multiplying your skill set, multiplying your knowledge, multiplying your character, your values. Maybe for you, as we become more whole, as we become more like Christ, as we become transformed, we have the opportunity to share who we are. Not just the one who has changed us, though that may be the best thing we could ever share. So my encouragement for you is look for an opportunity, simple as a conversation, maybe as simple as a note, with a stranger, with a friend, with a neighbor, with a spouse. Look for a way that you can multiply yourself. Multiplication is never forced, it's never demanded, but the invitation is always offered. As you go this week, may you go being willing to give joyfully and generously to take who that you are and like Christ to be blessed, broken, and shared. Let's stand together and worship.
As you go this week, church, let me invite you, encourage you that you are going into a story, a story where language and communication was for so many years confused that we were scattered and alone, scattered and confused, but in Christ and through Christ, unity, community is made possible. And so who will we be? How will we go from here? As you go this week, may you go hearing and being encouraged by Paul's words to the early church from Philippians 2, where he says this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with a one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Unity is possible. Community is possible. Transformation, redemption, wholeness is possible. But it takes us remembering Christ, blessed, broken, given, to make it possible. Go in peace. Go in hope. Go in wholeness. Amen.